Okay, um, yes, I know yeah. which one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, great. I'm glad you guys are already talking about SOAS. So welcome to our Pilates round on SOAS, the super SOAS. I've been having a lot of fun teaching this this week to the group classes. Uh, there's so many things, and what I find that I'm teaching is how to keep it open more than I'm teaching how to work the psoas, which is not always the case when you talk about a specific muscle like glute med. We were talking about how to fire glute med, not how to release glute med when we work on that. But psoas um, tends to be needing either tight, so it tends to be tight and overworked more than it tends to be long and underworked. So um, I, did you guys have any specific questions? I have a little thing that I wanted to show you in my head, a little reminder of the anatomy, and then I will, then we can show you some, where's mine here? <laughs> Which one was mine again? I'll use it. I'll just make a, a like comment you. for, um, I thought it was interesting. I was reading about the SOA from Wikipedia that how I guess more of the Caucasian population has a maybe a SOAS minor, and that's not really prevalent in African Americans. And um, I don't know. Sometimes they say that that people have a really tight SOAS major. It's almost more. It um, it's almost a. I'm not saying this is like gospel, but it's almost indicative of like their really anxious or like flight, you know, cause it's like, they're really tight there and they like don't have a lot of core strength, whether that's like real or not. I don't know, but I found that on Wikipedia. So I just thought that was interesting. Dispel the myths. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. yeah. Are you saying that it's like, an actual, like extra muscle or are you talking about the iliacus? Um, they were the, they were calling it the, so the psoas minor. Huh? that some, some people have and a lot of people don't, so. Yeah. Yes, read that too. Yeah. yes we have so as major and minor. Typically, we learn them in school, but we talk about just so as as a one whole um, more. Uh, and I think function-wise, it's pretty much the same. I don't think that the minor does anything really differently. But um, then, then we also want to differentiate a little bit between psoas and iliacus and the iliopsoas. So just, just for clarification purposes, um, psoas, what, I, what we call specifically psoas, are the fibers that run from the spine, so that T12 or L1, right, origins, anterior transverse processes, through towards the front of the body into the lesser trochanter. Where it becomes, so, so psoas has the, is the part of the conjoined muscle that actually can affect the spine, right? Whereas iliacus is going from the inside of the ilia. So inside your ASIS, right deep in there, it's lining that and then those fibers also go to the lesser trochanter and the interesting thing is is that the fibers of the psoas from the spine and the fibers of the iliacus join as they come into that lesser trochanter that's what we call the iliopsoas but differentiate it because their proximal attachment points are so vastly different but in the end, they have that same tenderness. They kind of conjoin as a ten, one single tendon into that lesser trochanter of the femur. So just to make that distinction, if we're going to talk about the two joint muscle, that's the hip flexor that affects the spine, that is only psoas. If we're talking about iliopsoas, we're not talking about the two joint feature really uh, there's the psoas portion but we're, we're including the iliacus and we're talking about iliacus that is a single joint muscle yeah so that that makes a difference in determination so iliacus can play a role role on the pelvis but it, iliacus cannot play a role on the spine yeah okay so that was one thing that i thought was just really to get clear in your head and if and and notice that the direction of the fibers this is my big thing the direction of the fibers 
uh, from the psoas are a little more direct line down. From the iliacus are diagonal down. So that's also something to really pay attention to just because I think that's so important to understand the line of pull of the muscle, right? So then I thought, well, how do we demonstrate this clearly uh, and just kind of have a picture in our head? And the way, and I was, as I've been teaching this week, I actually wanted to, tr to show my class this, but I thought it might be too much information and not enough workout because they're here for workout, not for information really. So I thought I would show it to you <laughs> today. So I um, thought about, okay, how do we sort of really understand what's happening? If you took a TheraBand around your back, so if, if I could, actually this one's probably in better shape, a broadband TheraBand around the back, right? That would sort of mimic psoas. But remember, psoas is actually from the front. I can't, I can't. It's not going to come from back here. It's going to come from in here at the spine. And then its direction of pull is going to end up being here into my crotch, right? So into my um, lesser trochanter of that femur. So this is the direction. Hopefully you can see. I'll stand up. You can see that blue band. That's the direction that it's going. Um, so if I... And then it's action. So now if I, if I put it here, if it shortens, right, the action as it's shortening, I need more hands, is, um, so if I pull it short, I get hip flexion, right? So that's the action of the muscle. The, um, and, and I just feel like it's nice to look at it this way and to understand. So the other piece of that is if, I don't hip flex, and so as tightens, one of two things can happen. One is I can extend my spine, so hyperlordosis. Right, so if psoas pulls and this is fixed, then what happens is this goes forward. So I get an arch, right? These vertebra that it's attached to go forward. Yes, pulling, right? So then the other thing is that that can happen in hip flexion is not just hip up, it's trunk down is also can be hip flexion. And that, this is more gravity induced, but where that is happening is here, right, again, is if I go here and sit straight up, that's hip flexor, so as, right? That's hip flexion. So the two muscles that do our hinge back roll down are so as and rectus abdominis. There's no way to get around that. That is what's working to get you up, especially with a straight back. That's what's working to get you up. Yeah, that's hip flexion and trunk up. Trunk up like that is rectus. It is purely rectus, really, that brings you up. Do the obliques do something? Sure. Are they gonna do a lot? No way. They don't have to. They've got the big big brother watching, two big brothers watching, rectus and psoas. So just keep that in mind, right? It's, we think about hip flexion as psoas, but it also has to do with where the trunk is and trunk flexion. So that is also hip flexor work to bring the trunk up. So as work, actually, um, to bring the trunk up. Yeah? Okay, anatomy lesson over. Do you guys have any, any questions on that? Yes. Um, so I'm curious because um, when we talk about, and maybe this is jumping ahead a little bit, but <clears throat> when we talk about hip, um, so as strength versus tightness, back to Kim's question, um, you know, I, we, like you mentioned, we, we see a lot of tightness and um, overwork, but I wonder if, um, like, I, I see overwork happening if people are sitting upright and actually using their posture, but what about people who are not doing that, which is the majority of the population, if we're honest? 
um, and they're just kind of sitting and slouching or, or letting a backrest hold them up, is the psoas really working then? And if not, then is that, can that person then have a short, weak psoas? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So good, good question. I'm going to break it apart and hopefully I'll answer all the parts. And if not, you can ask me again. Okay. So let's look at two different types of people. Let's look at the people who are likely to have a weak psoas. And they would be your long ligamented hypermobile people um, who tend to be loosey goosey. So I come to mind and some of you know him, my son Leif right, is this lanky long, he's now 6'1", got just even longer, with these long legs and a really loose, um, you know, very mobile trunk. So for a long time, he could not, and even now, it is so much work for him to sit up like this. He cannot get his back up. And he's got the mobility. Too. Oh, he's got the mobility. It's not a it's not a hamstring tightness issue where it is with other people. It's a, this just starts to burn right away. He cannot get himself up there or these kick in. And he's chronically overusing his hip flexors here. Um, so that would be, uh, and he has a lot of hip extension. So that's one way to know if it's a long and weak or a tight and weak. So hip extension is not an issue. He has plenty. So what that tells you, if he can't, if he has hamstring length, he has hip extension and he can't sit here because as soon as he does, he grabs in here. Um, that is going to be uh, long and weak, right? And those hypermobile trunks are really, um, hard to stabilize. So, and it real they really rely on psoas a lot more than somebody who has a lot more strong trunk strength and stability and those paraspinals working more. So it's paraspinals too, but that's really hip flexor work to sit up in that position. So, um, so that person might feel like their psoas is always tight, but it's because they're so weak and long, actually, that it's that hard to hold that up. Um, and then, and, and they often, like he often goes in spasm. I have to often go in and release the psoas because, because it can't work, because it's so weak and long, then it just does this instead of like this sort of normal kind of contraction that we want to see in somebody else. And then we have our elderly population with these posture is usually never, they're more like this. Their posture is usually never all the way up, right? It's not a big difference, but it is a big difference. So these tend to be our short and tight psoas. And there are a number of reasons why that happens. So if we talk about in the aging process, and degenerative disc and stenosis. The preferred posture for somebody like that is to have more space in the spine. They tend to either one or two things, tuck and go forward, or even not tuck and just be a slightly forward. So then we're, they're walking in that hip flexion all the time. So they never really pass the leg behind. And that also happens in people who are sitting chronically. Right, sitting chronically really does tighten up the psoas over time. So another reason not to sit for your job. You guys are in the right profession. <laughs> and then stretching it when it's that tight is painful. Not even barely stretching it, just stretching it out long is painful. Yeah, so sometimes it can be really hard to stretch. And it's also really hard to stretch without them just getting a big, huge pull in their lumbar spine. And that is because of where psoas comes from, it's, its proximal attachment point. So that's why when we do the Thomas stretch off the edge of the table, we, can, we, make, we put them in posterior tilt and we make sure their low back stays flat down. Because if, your back, if their backs are arching while you're stretching psoas, are you really stretching psoas? 
Nope. You're maybe stretching rectus and you're maybe stretching iliacus, but you're not really stretching psoas. So if the back's arching up while you're trying to stretch psoas, you're not really stretching psoas, right? You're allowing psoas to go down with you. It's not actually getting pulled at both ends, which is what we want. Yeah, and, and that's, that takes us, that can take us into that, <laughs> takes me on a whole diatribe. So I'm gonna pause <laughs> and let you guys pipe in if you have any comments on that or if I answered it enough. I just had a, a question on the psoas stretch on the, um, what's that thing called? The roller. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't off here, but um, I was feeling like that I was getting a better stretch if I crossed my foot over. And is that, would that relate to the direction of the muscle fibers? Would, would I still be stretching the psoas? Crossing it over. So like um, one knee's to my chest, the other's legs extended. And then like um, I crossed the leg. I just had the foot on the floor because uh, I'm pretty tight. <laughs> so when, yeah, the other leg is out. Okay. And then you put that foot on the floor that's up in the air. No, the other one. Oh. Yeah. And then I just crossed it over that foot. I mean, over the knee. Cross the right over the left. The yeah. right over the left. Yeah. yeah. Oh, to get more stretch? Yeah. Is that is oh. that so as that I'm getting a stretch in? In which leg? The left or the right? The left leg. No, I just kept the foot on the floor. I didn't open that like that. Oh, oh, just like this. Yeah. Um hmm. I don't know. Okay. It was, just, it was an experiment, but I was like, is that really my psoas? Because, I mean, it felt like I was getting more of a stretch. So. If, you're, if you're putting pressure on this thigh to get it to go down, mm -hmm. that could be more psoas. Mm. But not at the – so what happened to me when I did this is I arched my back. Mm. So now I've taken psoas somewhat off stretch because my back is arched. Maybe you were better than I was doing it. So when I come to this stretch, I really – Start, I like to start with that exercise that I call rib cage control here. So wide shoulders on the floor, ribs pulling down, hollowing. So like I'm trying to pull my spine down to the floor or even sometimes putting that little ball here behind the spine, so spine to floor. And then stretching my leg, keeping one in. The one into the chest really helps me keep this concave body posture and then stretch the leg off of that. So the concave body posture, the reason for that is to pull the proximal attachment of the psoas as far away as I can from its distal attachment. Mm -hmm. So if I concave down, I'm pulling this, the part of psoas that's on my spine down away to the floor. Mm -hmm. And then if I stretch that leg, now I'm pulling the other end away as far as I can. So the distance between the two points is much greater than if I arch my back, I've just shortened that distance. So I've taken the stretch away. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it, um, I think that I need to keep my leg up higher um, just and get more in that scoop to feel it. Um, the other yeah that I was I was like oh well maybe because my hips I'm so turned out that's why maybe I was feeling like my leg was inside um that felt yeah. Like, but um yeah it was just I mean that's a key point to keep you have to keep in that the coccyx curl and so in order to do that you know you have to keep the weight more towards yeah. your head rather than getting away yeah yeah it's this it's dropping it's really that concaving of the belly mm -hmm. that Helps get that stretch more pure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Without that, I, here I can go to the floor, but I've arched my back, so I've taken myself off of stretch to mm -hmm. get there. And then, and then people people do this all the time, and they go, "Oh, it's not a big stretch." So I have to keep reminding them, "No, that's not where we're going. This is where we want to go." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So play with that some more, and then you know, if you wanted to put. The leg, I don't feel like my leg, I, granted I have tight hips, but I don't feel like I could get my leg yeah, 
down um, without really arching my back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, then I also feel a little twisted, but again, the, my hip rotators are really tight. So maybe, um, maybe that has something to do with it too. Okay. Well, it's, I think it's just important to just like the, depend everyone's body is a little bit different, but just, I, you know, yeah. the feel stretch for that or the positioning. Yeah. So that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. I have an interesting uh, potential situ- or not situation. My, my friend uh, was a really uh, prolific runner and long legs, kind of short trunk in person. And she um, all of a sudden, so she felt like it was all was pretty sudden. She felt like her foot was flopping when she was trying to extend into her run. And they didn't actually ever figure out exactly what it is, but they thought it was a tight psoas causing that. And I wondered if that, if maybe there was something, something pulling even on her spine then to make her foot not react as she wanted it to. Does that make sense? Yes. I think we need a lot more information. Yeah. I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah. I, I think she probably has a nerve impingement issue if she's having trouble getting her leg out there. Yeah, she's okay now. But. Yeah, if, if that was the case. Whereas if you think about where psoas is, it can pull those vertebrae into a funky rotation if it gets tight. So imagine, right, the vertebra are, we're talking about the transverse processes. That's where psoas attaches. So if psoas on one side pulls, it can cause a rotation too because it has a bit of a diagonal. Luckily, it's not very diagonal. It's just slightly so. So it may just be a slight something, but tight enough in there might be that the nerve runs out of space, or maybe there's an impingement from the back too. Yeah, yeah that's that's where I would go. And releasing that psoas might release some of that pressure on the spine. So that is something that I use a lot: is when people are in a poor rotation at their pelvis, or when they're um, having pressure, I often find that releasing the psoas gives them relief because it's taking that anterior pull off of the vertebra. So if we can take that anterior, I don't know if you can see because my shirt's not very tight, but if I can take, get rid of this anterior pull that psoas might cause, I can give rest and length and space to those vertebra. So that might be what was going on. And in runners, if their psoas gets tight, right? Runners, if you imagine, their legs have to go behind, right? They have to get the leg behind. Um, so if their leg can't go behind, what could they do in compensation? Pull the leg forward. Pull the yeah. spine forward. So lumbar hyperextension. And you see that a lot with runners. And it's amazing how weak some of them are in their core. And somebody told me once their patient, they told their patient they have to tighten and strengthen their core. And they said, oh, no, I can't do that. Then I won't be able to stride behind me. Uh, like, uh, then you're striding behind you with the wrong part of your body. So, um, so yeah, it's, um, so that would be the runner thing. But, yeah. Well, I'll ask her more. Ask her more, yeah. It might be an interesting case study. It would be an interesting case study. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Um, okay. So the other things that are, uh, here's my pet peeves with working with psoas, is that people often, again, don't know how to stretch it properly. So when you come up to a lunge type position to stretch psoas, right, that I can stretch here in this vertical position, if I tuck the tail down and actually posterior tilt and then go forward, I'm much more, I keep my belly back, right? I'm much more likely to then get a stretch at the psoas than if I just go forward here. Like I have no stretch on right now with my trunk going downward. My psoas has nothing happening. But if I come up, squeeze my glute, lift up through my belly and almost I'll exaggerate, but almost leaning backwards to go, then I really end up stretching that psoas open, right? And then making sure that I'm not rotating. So I even think about squeezing the inner thighs a little bit to keep me in line and push this butt. This butt has to do a lot of work forward 
in order for me to get a stretch. If your chest goes down, you take psoas off stretch. Does that make sense? So a psoas stretch mm -hmm. should be with your trunk upright, not with your trunk folded down. Yeah. And so it's one of my pet peeves on the reformer when we do the eaves lunge type position or the scooter position that everybody's sitting there like this, stretching their leg out behind them like that. Because that's not a psoas stretch, really. Yeah? The psoas stretch would be if I bring it up, squeeze that butt forward, now my psoas is on stretch. Right? And the more I, sorry, the more I pull the belly back, the bigger that stretch is going to be. And now you get, that's it, Allison's doing it. And even lifting that knee up, Allison, is better. Yes, and then squeezing that glute, pull the belly back. Yep, and keep working to straighten that back leg, but keeping that posture. So keep tucking the bottom, pulling the belly back. Right, that's a really nice psoas stretch. If you take the hands down to the bar, you're not really stretching psoas through its range, yeah? I'm actually glad you brought that up because that is one of the things that um, the minute they put their hands on the bar, they want to just dive into it. And then it kind of it becomes more of like, I don't know, a lat back stretch or something. And um, when I have them take the hands off the bar, they don't like it as much because uh, it's more work and it doesn't feel as good. But then they're actually stretching their psoas and not whatever's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's really key. I think a great key is to learn to get teach or to get people to understand how to stretch it and to learn how to cue them to stretch it really well. Yeah. Um, so when it goes forward, you're just stretching the, I mean, when the back is towards the ground, it's, you're just stretching the well, what do you, hamstring in the front, I feel a lot. Um, so if I come forward, I start to feel hamstring in the front. I might get some at the hip, but I'm not differentiating anymore. Um, and that's only when I come up. If I go down, I don't really feel, I can do this all day and not really feel a stretch. But if I try and come up with that low lunge, like I have to really work to open up that hip. Now I'm really opening up my hip in the back. Yeah, with the trunk coming up. So the other place, you know, sometimes I'll go into this deep lunge, allowing the hamstring in the front to go on stretch and then pick up the back knee. Now, what am I stretching? Yes, which one? Not all quads. Rectus femoris, because that's my two joint muscle. The more I come up, again, the more I get rectus because it crosses the hip too. But really, any sort of so knee folding is the stretching the quads, not the psoas so much. Yeah, so that might be where this position is more useful. But otherwise, I try to isolate that psoas and the stretch is trunk up, butt forward, tummy in, back backwards, back backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, so those are my pet peeves in my anatomy lesson. <laughs> What do we do uh, to strengthen the line balance? The, what's the opposing muscle group of the psoas? Glutes. Yeah. Glutes, like glute max, really. Uh, glute medius somewhat and minimus. Not really the hip rotators so much. Yeah, but really the glutes, the extending glutes. So if you want to turn off psoas, what would you go work? Glutes. Thank you, Kim, is on fire. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if we want to shut down psoas, we're going to look for glutes. If we want to open psoas, we're going to look for glutes. And this is where I'm finding that my classes have been leading to because I would say 80% of people have two um, weak glutes that are too weak, uh, and the 20% have a psoas that's too weak. And so it's, and it's really only those long, flexible types that I find have a weak psoas. Everybody else is just 
clenched in their psoas and short and tight and pretty strong actually. So what, how do you test for that? Um, we don't really in Pilates, but one way that you could test for psoas strength would be kind of that, for in a strong person would be sort of that hanging leg lift, which I, at my strongest in my life, I was never able to do just because it's a lot of hip flexor that I didn't have. Um, but uh, so that's one way to test it. The other way to test and see uh, that you would look for is can they extend all the way? That would be length. And then can they hold? I'm trying to think of how you really see functionally if the psoas is too weak. And I don't really know functionally how you would know that. It won't, if it's weak, it won't impact gait. Uh, it will impact just that sitting posture, that the long sit. It will impact that. Yeah. The rest is, um, I, and I wonder, so what I've been teaching my class is that for the ab work, for example, all our fives, our legs and tabletop example, if you create a stable base, so this must make more sense now, hopefully to them and us, but if we make a stable base, belly down, tight holding trunk, then the psoas should be more free to move and not to grip, right? As soon as that back arches off and your legs are in tabletop, right, psoas is shortening more than it needs to. So creating, I had my class this morning, creating that really stable trunk position in neutral, they don't have to go to flat back, but in neutral stabilizing and then doing leg motions out and in and feeling what happens at their hip. The hip flexor works, but it's just a comfortable amount of work. So people who, the minute they get to tabletop, their psoas grabs, maybe they're not stable enough in their center, or may, which I think is most likely that they're not stable enough in the center, or they're just so chronically on in those hip flexors, they can't get them to relax. So that's what I've been focusing on for there. I also did have them do uh, these leg lifts, right? That is psoas working. And this, what I had them do is, pull hollow and then work so that it doesn't over grip and pull them into this arch. Yeah. So I just isolated that motion and they, I should get some feedback, but I don't think anybody was over grippy that way. Is your leg in turnout or uh, parallel? It is pretty much parallel. There's a tiny, tiny inkling of a turnout, Okay. but it's not full turnout would look like that. Yeah. It's just, um, my knee is still pointed up at the sky. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be, this is a nice way to work. So as with that intentional upper position for the belly to pull down. So it's a lot easier than, you know, when I was in gymnastics, they would make us do these, which are so intense that I can't <laughs> do them for very long. And my quad want to cramp and, then that's not even the worst one. This was the worst one. I don't know if any of you guys had to do these. I don't think I can do them. I don't think I've ever been able to do them and try and lift up there. <laughs> Without moving. I don't know if any of you guys can do those. Yes. They, yeah. Okay. Good. Just not just me, but most gymnasts could just do them. They go, boop, boop, boop. and I'm just like, wait, what? I can't get my leg up. How are you getting your leg up? <laughs> like, I can get my leg up if I push. But then, you know, the gymnasts are doing this and then up to a handstand. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. My, I never did that one. I could never do that to the press to here. I could never hold myself up with my legs up. I didn't have enough strength in my psoas for that. So, those might be the only people that you're working on psoas strength with, perhaps. Um, I think I'm trying to think who else you would work on strengthening psoas. I think I would prefer, even if in our older clients, that we strengthen glutes. That's more functional. Um, and will help open the psoas and give them access to it as they need. 
after a hip replacement, we maybe work on lifting up, but I've, I don't know that I've ever put a TheraBand over the top of the thigh and asked somebody to lift it back towards them. You know, that would be sort of a, a so a strengthening would be this sort of thing where I'm um, creating resistance from below and pulling upward. I mean, I don't think I've ever given this exercise to somebody. Um, we definitely have worked on marching with clients, just getting enough to bring the leg up out of the way for balance and for strengthening. So post hip surgery, sometimes that's what we're working on, but more often than not, it's always glutes and opening the hips that I end up working on. I have a quick question. Um, so a lot of those exercises that you mentioned um, were with the straight leg and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that pulls in a lot of the quad and other um, hip flexor muscles, right? Yes, so it does. Isolate um, psoas, then would you do that bent leg motion? Um, you can. I've done it seated on a chair or on the chair, the Pilates chair or on a regular chair. It's not almost not enough lever uh, to get the work. But yes, you're right. If we were going to isolate to get the quads out of the picture, you would have to bend the knee and do it. Yeah. That's it. You could do that, Allison, too, if somebody needed it. There. We do a lot of, so, I mean, so it's a lie to say that psoas doesn't work when we do roll-ups. I just told you, right, the full roll-up is psoas and rectus, really. And we, if you're rolling, hinging up, it's totally psoas and rectus and erector spinae. That's what's getting your trunk up and down. And that's great. And it has its place. But um, rolling up and down is very um, hip flexory. So you want to you want to know that hip flexors have to work. So it's a lie to say that they don't work, and it's a lie to say that in tabletop they don't work. It's just that we want them to work only as much as they have to, and not work to try and support everything. So that's where that stable base really helps. If you create that stable base of motion before you create the motion, that really helps. Um, yeah. Do you guys want me to take you through a few of those exercises or do you want to, do you have more questions? Take us through a few, if that would be my vote. I don't have any more questions right now. Yeah, so you take through the exercises. That are yeah, maybe okay. So let me show you what I started the class off with this morning because this is something newer that I've just been playing with but I thought it was pretty effective is, um, <clears throat> If you start off here with a roller <clears throat> under your knees for a moment and just, I just, I like people to have sort of a baseline. So just take a few breaths and kind of fall into the mat. <clears throat> and then once you feel like you've settled, bring the roller underneath your hips and just oops, keep it there under the sacrum for a moment. And then Settle back in. So the ribs, the shoulders wide, the ribs settle down. And then curling that tail into the coccyx curl from here, squeezing the glutes up into the hips. And then releasing down. Right, so exhaling, rib cage dropping, tail scooping. And inhaling. And exhaling, rib cage down. So here we're pulling that proximal attachment down towards the floor, scooping that tail, squeeze the glutes into the op open fronts of the hips. And then release. So quads play a part in this. A tight quad will limit how much you can do this too. But this was, I thought, a nice way to open up, to get going, to activate the backside and then in. And then from there, you could choose whether or not you wanted to move them. We moved into bridging up from here with feet on the roller. So we took this out. And then if you take this out and go onto feet on the roller, 
you can then bridge up and it feels actually, I think it kind of all those pieces come together really nicely. The other, um, the other thing I was doing is having them take the roller out underneath their ankle. And you could do this with flat feet. I just think it's uh, with legs flat out. I think it's just a little, gives a little feedback to start here, just a little more help. And you can think about dropping that belly down to, so I'm pulling the belly in, allowing a bit of a pelvic tilt, not like a full on coccyx curl, a little pelvic tilt, so that I feel the energy travel through my belly out the back. Then I can reach that right, I'm doing the right leg first, the right leg long and float it up. And it feels like the right amount of work. So keep on that right side, drop the belly, belly first, leg goes up. And are you pressing quite a bit with your uh, foot that's on the roller? It's the, le the leg on the roller is solidly on the roller. It's not floaty. It's definitely on the roller. I'm not pushing down to the floor, but it is solidly there creating, helping me create that trunk stability. So belly first, think about going through the back of the leg to get up to the top and then try the other side. So belly first, think of going through your belly, reaching up and down. And then that should feel like the right amount of hip flexor activation. Right, nice. Yeah, so then, um, Jennifer, you just did. The next thing I did was have them bring their feet together and open to diamond. <laughs> yep, to release. So that's a nice release here. And then I had them start to try and find the pelvic neutral in this position. So that's a lot of times a little more into an anterior tilt than people think, because a lot of times they hold in a very posterior tilt. So just to find that neutral. And then I had them start doing upper ab. And why would I do that here, do you think? Right, so that I can't posterior tilt and use psoas to do the work. I really have to find my obliques if I do it this way. Yeah, right. So we did this, this sort of thing, just to get those abs firing to make sure that I had uh, the right muscles working. And then I had them take the... Just really quick on that, you, I'm assuming you're, you're not just letting your hips flop. There is a little engagement in your hips to keep them up. Nope. Right? I'm letting my hips flop. Oh, okay. Mine yeah, are flopping. What doing. Okay. Is that, uh, yeah, because I, I just don't want to work with them right now. I want to let them go. Okay, the right, that's the focus. Okay, great. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I flopped in Pilates on purpose. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, okay, so then it, going to tabletop, I actually started them with predict the load all over again, just keep it, having them pay attention to their abs and starting the ab stability before anything else happens. So the exhale is the belly, then the legs can freely shift on that. Exhaling the belly, legs freely shift, yeah? So they could also use the hands behind the leg, but I was trying to get them to do it without and to really feel that that stability in the center is the key. And then taking that a step further was belly dropping, legs extending. If I, I and this is, I think I've given you guys this image before, but if you imagine one of those puffy dolls that's blown up with air, if you step on the stomach, the legs and arms shoot up and out, right? So that's the feeling, stepping on the stomach, sinking it to freely let the legs go. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't you, like it's like that, <laughs> somebody steps on your stomach and all the limbs go, but that's the feeling because the stomach's getting squashed down and the legs and arms can go. Yeah, but, and then the work stays in that trunk rather than in the legs. Right, so that works really well for tabletop and for straight up. It gets a lot harder to find that as the legs go down lower, right? We're challenging 
so as. But again, if my trunk stays stable, I don't grip in the hips so much. And you could do that uh, earlier this week in the class, I had them working on this one again, and then back down. So hands behind the legs, sinking the belly, pressing open, sinking the belly. Now my hips are not on too much. They're doing just the right amount of work. Right? Because my belly and that lat connection with my arms are really helping that motion. Yeah. And then we did um, prone. So prone series is fantastic for getting the glutes firing. Uh, it's fantastic for opening the hips. So I did two different things in the two different classes. One was just sort of that classical pressing the pelvis down, leg floats up kind of work. The other was bending the knees, working, squeezing, and just trying to find the glutes on. Now I put, by bending the knees, I'm putting rectus femoris on stretch too. So that might not work for everybody. You could do it in a straight leg position to get those glutes firing up, right? Just so that we don't have to deal with the rectus. But um, you could also do it here. And that would open up psoas um, if you can keep that tail long. Yeah, arching into the back here, again, puts the psoas, puts the butt up, right? That's um, now tight psoas again with that space down there. So I really want to push into that space, fill it up with my pelvis so that psoas goes on stretch and then work. I can do straight, I can do bent legs there. And then we did a side kick. So front kick is so as back kick is glute. So this is a really nice one if you want to get both those things working. Yeah, so that, that was a really nice one we did this morning. And then we worked on the lunges and the stretches that I was showing you earlier um, with getting the trunk in the right position with the lunges. So that's sort of what my class was like um, what classes have been like this week. The other one earlier this week I did just working on holding the band here and using the glutes to press the hips open and back. So that's a really nice one too, finding that work. So not pulling the arms back, but pushing the hips forward. And you could take that, keep that tension and, and go into thigh stretch or these thigh stretches are really nice. With that, that really encourages that open. Uh, and then we did this one, pressing up, and we transitioned into plank from there. So really open front of hip plank is also really nice for psoas. And then swanning, the other, that's what I was going to do this afternoon, is working into full swans, because the other way to stretch the psoas would be to put it on stretch from the top, right? So that would be, rather than the leg itself, would be the trunk stretching. So picking up the low belly and then trying to put the pelvis back, but I'm not super hyper arching my low back. That would be here, right? I'm really pulling that low belly up, trying to push the pelvis down. That can also open the psoas from the top part, as long as I don't hyper lordosis myself, yeah? So that could be a way to open so as too, is the trunk press up. Yeah. Everyone's got to go. <laughs> Actually, I have a, I have a, sorry. I have all the <laughs> yes. Well, great. Thank you guys so much for joining. Let me know if you have questions, feel free to email. And um, if you have a topic for next week, send me an email. If not, I will, I'll stick you with my next theme and we'll keep going that way. Okay. Awesome. You guys, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. You know what would be good is if you continue this, if you could go through your theme the week before. Oh, and then you could use it in the class. You could use it, particularly if we're partnering with you on classes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Taking that, if I take one of the evening classes, yeah. Continue your theme. Yeah. That sounds like a really good idea. Okay. That's my idea for today. I like your idea.
Because that could be even a week more organized. <laughs> because I sort of, I don't, I um, like I have a plan for this for four weeks at a time usually, and that I review. But I just have to stay on top of it instead of waiting till it expires, knowing yeah. ahead. You just have to do it's just extra one week. Yeah. Right. Because then. Well, and then it's not extra anymore. Right. It's just exactly. One time. Not extra anymore. Not to my God. Yeah. I think I both Dave and I want to know about to an email about your um, the humidifier or the air purifier. Yeah. Want to know what what make and model it was. It's, oh, it's a Dyson. Yeah, we see that. Dave. Yes. You'll see. Oh, and right. it's, um, I don't know what the model is. Right, maybe. The box is outside. I'm going to recycle it. Oh, okay. Um, it's down, by the, down the stairs in the mm -hmm. outside. Yeah, I'm going to try to see that. I like it that much. Um, what are we turning off? Oh. Uh, come on. <laughs>